read the end of the story this morning because there's no way that we would have time to cover the life and events of Joseph that lead up to what we're going to talk about today. I trust you are familiar with the life of Joseph. If you are not, may I encourage you, since there's no evening service tonight, you'll go home with a full belly, take a nap, <laughs> and after you wake up from that nap, open up the scripture, start in Genesis 37, and read about the life of Joseph. But I hope to be able to still use his life as an illustration of the points, even if you're not real familiar with his life. Genesis chapter 50, I'd like to read verses 15 through 21. Would you read along with me, please? It says, When Joseph's brothers saw their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs that we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. Now they said that in the third person because, because remember, um, Joseph was one of 12 children. Uh, his dad, Jacob, whose name was uh, eventually changed to Israel by God, uh, had 12 children, but he had them by different wives. So Joseph was only the half-brother to some of these uh, individual brothers that caused him the harm that they did. Your father left these instructions before he died. Verse 17, this is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we talk about the life of Joseph, this amazing young man who went through so many adverse situations, so many injustices, and yet in all of those situations never developed a bad attitude, but sought to live for you, and you honored him, and you promoted him in those places to the place where he was second in all of command, in Egypt and able to provide for his brothers when a famine struck their land. And so, Father, as we look at his life and talk about principles related to Thanksgiving, help us to be able to assimilate this into our own lives so that when bad things come our way, we will still be able to give thanks. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The very first principle, I think, that will help us to be able to give thanks uh, when things aren't going so well is to recognize that suffering is a part of living in a fallen world, a fallen, sinful world. Joseph ended up suffering as an individual because of man's sin, induced inhumanity toward his fellow man. His brothers were jealous, and his brothers were cruel, and his brothers did things to him that they should not have done because they were sinners. And oftentimes, all of us will be affected by the sin that has plagued our world, whether it's the sin and the curse upon the earth so that the earth doesn't bring full its fullness. I, she talked about growing grass. Personally, I've never seen lush green fields in Florida. <laughs> so I, all I have are weeds. <laughs> My grass doesn't grow. I try. It just doesn't work. But uh, I, that's a result of the curse, isn't it? Now, some places I know. Some places they have green grass. Uh, but the curse has affected our planet, our very planet. Our curse has affected us in every aspect so that we are not what we ought to be and we behave in a way that we ought not to behave. And Joseph brothers behaved in a way that they should have never behaved toward their brother. And he experienced their inhumanity and ended up suffering as a result of it. His own brothers took the coat of many colors that his father had made for him and then they threw him into a pit they really wanted to kill him but Reuben you remember Reuben the older brother interceded for him and actually saved his life but still didn't save him from being in the pit and ended up and eventually ending up in slavery Joseph was sold into slavery and eventually was a slave in Egypt 
because of his brother's jealousy and cruel treatment. He ended up in prison because of the lie of his master's promiscuous seeking wife. And ever since the days of Adam and Eve and their expulsion from the garden, there have been problems in humanity and there will always be problems in humanity. Recognize you will not be exempt from it. You will experience some sort of bad things in this life. All of us will. And we need to understand that so that we don't think that we ought to be exempt from that so that when that, those bad things come, we don't feel like, why me? Why me? I'll tell you why you and why me. Because we live in a sin-cursed world. We live in a world where people do things that they shouldn't do. We live in a world that's ravaged by disease because of the fall, because of the curse. We live in a world where our very earth has been affected. The very universe has been affected by sin. And so we have multiple forms of suffering on various levels. There's national suffering resulting from governmental oppression to poor economic policy, to a lack of natural resources, to government corruption and greed that affects all of us. There is community suffering resulting from crime to terrorism to religious persecution. Here in America, we, we may be exempt from a lot of that, although it's coming and we're seeing it even now, where when, when Christians want to stand up for certain moral rights, they're threatened with their jobs. I don't see it getting better. I see it getting worse. So how can you be thankful when you live in an environment like that? And it's much better here in America than it is in parts of the Middle East or other parts of the world. There's a, a, a level of suffering that occurs on the family level, resulting from everything from the loss of employment to illness of a family member, where individuals in the family suffer, maybe because a mom or a dad becomes sick and incur medical bills that can't be paid. Maybe the co-payments or the, the deductibles are too high. Maybe they don't have insurance. Maybe it's not an illness. Maybe it's the loss of employment. But we suffer oftentimes on a family level. And then there's finally individual suffering. Individual suffering that can be the result of any of the above as well as man's inhumanity toward man. Joseph was suffering on an individual level because of man's inhumanity toward man. And then all of us, all of us can experience suffering as a result of bad or foolish decisions. It doesn't have to be the sinfulness of others. It can be our own sin nature that causes us to make decisions that result in negative consequences in our life and oftentimes suffering. Sometimes we just call those stupid things, right? <laughs> you ever do stupid things? I used to do a lot of them as a teenager. Now I do less. Sometimes I still do stupid things. <laughs> now I pay for it more dearly than I used to. We used to get away with it a little easier when our bodies were a little more fit, a little younger, and recuperated a little faster. But sometimes we simply suffer because of dumb decisions that oftentimes are influenced, although we may not be aware of it, by our sinful natures. And so don't think, I ought to be exempt from problems. Why is this happening to me? This shouldn't happen to me. Life is full of problems. For some it'll be more and for others it will be less. And none of us know why some will suffer more and some will suffer less. But the bottom line is all will suffer to one degree or another. But don't let your suffering control your attitude. Don't let your suffering control your attitude. That leads me to the second point that I see here in the life of Joseph, realizing that you are not too good to suffer more than others. You see, some people feel like they've been dealt an unfair card. Hey, God, don't you know I'm in ministry? Or don't you know I'm going into ministry? And why does my wife end up with cancer? Or why do I end up with problems? Or why do they end up with problems? And, and we look at it and we feel like, ah, hey, I'm trying to serve you. I should be exempt from this, shouldn't I? Well, Joseph was probably one of the best guys that I've ever read about in Scripture, right? There's very little said that's negative about Joseph. Now, I know some people think he was sort of a little bit of a, maybe a braggart, you know, a little, had a little streak of arrogancy, and, you know, he told his brothers and his mother and his father about the dream that he had that someday they would bow down to him. 
And some people have said, well, he was prideful or arrogant. I'm not sure you can interpret his actions that way. Maybe. Maybe you could. But I think, I think that Joseph may simply have been relaying the dream that God had given to him, that someday indeed his brother and his, uh, his, his brothers and his father would indeed bow down before him. And so that's where we're at here in Genesis chapter 50. And they did. Is it arrogant and boastful to simply relay a dream that you had to others? Not necessarily. But that's, that's about the worst thing that we can attribute to Joseph as we look at the life of, life of Joseph. This man maintained his morality and integrity in various situations where most people would have failed. First of all, when he's sold into slavery, he serves his master at, 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 to the best of his ability. I mean, we don't see him walking around with sour grapes going, huh, I ain't going to do what he wants me to do. I didn't ask to be here. My brother sold me into this condition, and I ain't going to do a thing for you, buddy. Beat me all you want. I won't do anything for you. Now, actually, the Bible tells us that he pleased his master and that, and that he, he, he tried to honor him. And all that he did, and, and the Bible says that God was with Joseph, and, and God actually promoted Joseph in, his, in Potiphar's household, the one that he was the, uh, the slave in, and uh, to the point where Potiphar put him in charge of pretty much everything in his household. And then what happens? Here he is trying to honor God with his life, do everything right, and Potiphar wife, Potiphar's wife comes along and spoils it for him. Right? Do you remember the story? Uh, she finds him attractive for some reason. I don't know what he looked like or, or whether it was his personality or his attitude or what it was, but uh, she wants to sleep with him. And Joseph could have probably done it and got away with it. Sometime when his master, I say get away with it. You never get away with sin. Let me go back. Let me re rewind, <laughs> right? You never, we think we get away with it. We never get away with it. The Bible says be sure what? Be sure your sin will find you out. But he might have got away with it at least temporarily. But he didn't sleep with her. He said no to her. And he, and he runs, out of, runs, runs, runs out of the room and she, she grabs an article of his clothing and and she hangs on to it and she goes to her husband and she says, look, your servant tried to rape me, tried to sleep with me or whatever how, uh, she was saying. You know, he tried to go to bed. With, and, and so what happens? Potiphar gets angry at Joseph and unjustly throws him into prison. So here's a guy that's doing everything right. Here's a guy that's trying to please God with all of his heart and bad things happen to him. If anyone had the right to say, God, I should be exempt from this. I'm trying to do the best I can for you. It would have been Joseph. And then, while he's there in prison, he's still faithful. He still doesn't walk around with sour grapes. You know, he doesn't start up a gang in prison. <laughs> you know, start dealing drugs in prison and then doing bad things and, you know, trying to beat up on the guards and let's, hey, let's, let's stab that guy when we can. You know? No, Joseph instead is as faithful and as good and as honest as he can be while he's in prison to the point or the, the person who's in control of the prison that Joseph is in promotes him to be in charge of everything so that he didn't have to worry about anything. And he went out and took extended coffee breaks while Joseph was doing all the work because Joseph had a tremendous attitude in the midst of unjust suffering. That is so unlike us. When something unjust happens to us, we moan and groan and complain and tell everybody about it and develop bad attitudes. Joseph didn't. And so if there's anybody, anybody that was good enough that you might think they might be exempt from some sort of suffering, it would be Joseph, and yet he wasn't. He wasn't. Even there in prison, he had to serve many years before finally, finally he had the opportunity to interpret a dream for Pharaoh and get promoted to the position that he's in at this point, second in command of all of Egypt, where he's able to help out his family during a time of famine in their homeland. Don't use your circumstances as an excuse not to do your best and to have the right kind of attitude. Remember, all of us will suffer to one degree or another. None of us are exempt, and none of us are too good to be exempt. Thirdly, and I think this to be one of the most important principles that we can learn from the life of Joseph, remember God often uses bad situations to bring about good results. Joseph suffered at the hands of his brother. He was sold into slavery. He was falsely imprisoned because of Potiphar's wife's lies. 
bad things happened to Joseph. But those bad things that happened to Joseph led Joseph into being in the right place at the right time so that when his family back in the promised land was going through very difficult famine, Joseph was able to provide for them. But it took the bad things in his life to get him there. It took those unjust sufferings and those cruel treatments at the hands of his brothers to bring him to the place where he was. God took a lot of bad things and turned it into a really extremely good thing. But it was after many, many years of bad things. It didn't happen overnight. Sometimes, sometimes we're willing you know, to go through a little bit of suffering if we can see the light at the end of the tunnel and say, well, you know, in a week or two, this will all be over and everything will be hunky-dory. Everything will be better than it was before. Sometimes it takes years. Sometimes I don't think we'll ever see all of the positive things that can come about as a result of what we may have to suffer. Sometimes we may end up in glory before those things come about. But there are lots of benefits that God can work in the lives of individuals as a result of suffering. And I want to just name a few of those. First of all, there's benefits to self. What are they? What kind of benefits can we experience as a result of suffering? First of all, there's a deeper appreciation for life. People who face tragic illnesses, and I remember when my wife was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease, and that word came to us that, that she had um, Hodgkin's disease, and she was going to have to go through chemotherapy and radiation treatment, and I'm thinking, whoa, how are we going to do this? One of the benefits that it had in my wife's life is that it gave her a new appreciation for each and every day. She saw, you know, we're supposed to see every day as a gift, but do you? Do you really wake up in the morning and say, this is a gift from God, I'm alive, and I'm well, and I'm living, and I can serve Him? She, she gained that kind of appreciation, and I know others who have shared testimony of the same thing. We can gain a deeper appreciation of life. We can have positive, positive change in relationship to priorities. We begin to realize that stuff doesn't matter as much as people. We begin to put more emphasis on spending time on our relationships with our children or with our spouses or with our parents or with others. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, it says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourself also with the same attitude, because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. Our priorities change. Another benefit is that there's oftentimes increased personal strength. James chapter 1 verses 2 through 3 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. You know what I find in people who have suffered? I find a, a, a I can do it attitude. I've made it through worse than this. This is nothing. Man, I've had tougher times than this. This, it's, this is easy. I remember, as I've shared before, meeting um, the head of the Baptist Union in Belarus, the guy whose first name was Victor, who had spent 15 years in a Soviet gulag for being a pastor under communism. And, and, but this, ha this man had a, I'm not going to quit attitude. And the, the repression and the oppression and, and, and the, the laws that inhibit uh, religion and, and Christianity in, in the country of Belarus didn't bother him nearly as much as it may have bothered others because he had faced much worse. You know, it's like people who grew up in hard times and we see the kids complaining now. Mom, my cell phone's not working. How do you expect me to live? <laughs> How many of you remember a day when nobody had a cell phone? <laughs> You know, we, we have parents today that, that they, were, they get upset when the school says you've got to turn in your cell phone. Oh, oh, how am I supposed to contact my kid? Uh, maybe they'll survive for eight hours without you calling them. You know? but, but today, life, life is so different. And oftentimes we look at it and we say, hey, this is nothing. And hard, been through a lot worse. People develop an inner strength oftentimes through suffering that cannot be developed without going through that suffering. Another benefit. Increased personal holiness and character. Romans chapter 5 verses 3 through 4. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. Do we? 
And we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. Character. God is more concerned with your character than with your comfort. That's a saying I learned a long time ago. I repeat it often because I need to remember it. God is more concerned with my character than my comfort. He's more concerned with your character than your comfort as well. He wants you to be holy. And sometimes suffering is the refining fire that burns off the dross and helps you to be more holy. Another benefit of suffering. The Bible teaches that if we suffer for Christ, if our suffering is a result of living for Jesus, a result of persecution or, or giving up things, a result of going without for the sake of serving Christ, then the Bible re, uh, promises to those individuals eternal rewards. Listen to Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. Jesus said, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all sorts of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great, great, great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Great is your reward in heaven. If you are persecuted, if you suffer for the cause of Christ, whether it's outside persecution or simply giving up to serve or giving up to give, the Bible says you will experience eternal reward. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 8. And talk about someone who went through suffering for the sake of the gospel. Beaten multiple times, stoned to the point of death, run out of city after city after city. Just amazing suffering. And here's what he says about all of it. He says, I consider that our present sufferings, this is Romans 8.18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. It will be worth it all. It will be worth it all. And so there are multiple benefits to us. But there are also oftentimes benefits to others, and that's what we see in the life of Joseph. Now, Joseph benefited from his suffering eventually as well. It just took years for him to realize those benefits. It took years for him to be promoted to second in command of all of Egypt. But there were not only benefits to Joseph, there were benefits to others because of his suffering. He was able to provide for his family. And so we see those benefits to others somewhere on my... <laughs> we see those benefits to others. First of all, there is the positive changes that suffering has made in your life that will benefit others. You know what? When you become a better person, that, that's a benefit to others. When you become a better child, a better, more obedient, more godly son or daughter, that's a benefit to your parents. When, when you as husbands become a better person, that's a, that's a benefit to your wife. When you as wives become a better person, that's a benefit to your husbands. When you as people become better workers, that's a benefit to your boss. And, and so suffering as it builds character in us actually benefits everybody. But the better I am, the better the world is, even if it's only by one. But if all of us are better, if all of us are better as a result of suffering, if all of us have better character, increase holy, that's a benefit to the community. We don't often think that way. We just look at the suffering because that's what's immediate to us. That's what's plaguing us at the time. That's what we begin to fix our eyes on and can't take our eyes off of. But there are benefits, not only to self, but benefits to others. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, it says this, Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Another way that we can benefit others as we go through suffering is through helping them through their time of suffering. Helping them through their time of suffering. And finally, finally, the last way that I see in their... Uh, this is a, a, short, a short sermon on suffering <laughs> and, and the benefits of it, uh, actually on how it can change our perspective about giving thanks as we look at the fact that God can use our suffering, that God can use bad things in our lives to help us to be thankful all the time. The last one is the unknown ways that God may benefit others through your suffering. 
Joseph, I don't think Joseph saw the end of the line. I don't, see, I don't think he realized that someday, I mean, when he, was, when he was sitting there in the dungeon in Egypt, I don't think Joseph sat there thinking, you know, someday, someday, this is going to lead me to be second in command of all of Egypt. He didn't know that. He just kept, kept maintaining the right attitude, knowing that God could use it for good. And, and, and God did. Not only in the life of Joseph, not only in the life of Joseph's family and providing for them, they all moved down to Egypt. Now I know, you know, just like with the Chinese farmer, that led to some problems as well, right? Because they multiplied so rapidly, the Jewish race became so prolific that uh, the Egyptian pharaoh at that time became afraid and then put them all into slavery. But then that resulted in Moses and the miraculous deliverance of God from the land of Egypt and, the, and their journey into the promised land. But eventually, think of this, think of this, that because of Joseph's faithfulness, the lineage of the Jewish race was preserved. They might have all died out in the promised land because of the famine. Now you say, no, God would have found another way because you know, he had promised them that the Messiah would come through their loins. I, okay, I understand that, but this is the way he did it. Because of Joseph's suffering, the Jewish race was preserved and the Messiah came through the Jewish race and you and I to this day, thousands of years later, what, 3,000, 3,000, 4,000 years later, you and I are the benefits of Joseph's suffering. Do you think Joseph ever saw that? I don't. You and I are the benefits. We have experienced the benefits, I should say, of his suffering because the Messiah came through the Jewish race and Joseph was able to provide for the Jewish race by providing for his brothers when they left the, the land of Canaan because of the famine to come down into Egypt where they had plenty of food and Joseph could give it to them. Who knows? Who knows how God is going to use suffering in your life to make you better or to bless others. And that's what we have to remember. That's how we can go through the tough times of life and maintain the proper attitude. Even, even our Lord portrayed this kind of attitude. The Bible says that who for the joy set before him, for the joy set before him endured the cross, suffering the pain. Jesus knew that God would use his death, his crucifixion, his cruel treatment at the hands of unjust men to benefit millions and millions of people with salvation. You and I are the recipients of that salvation because Jesus went through the suffering that he went through. And he's our example. But he's not only our example, he's our Savior. And maybe you're here today and you're listening to this and for the first time you've heard something about what Jesus did for you. Or maybe you've heard it before but just never paid much attention to it. The Bible says that Jesus Christ was the only begotten Son of God. That He came into this world to take on flesh so that He might die for you and for me. That He might pay completely for every sin that we have ever committed when He died on the cross. He became the atoning sacrifice for you and for me. And by His sacrifice on the cross, He appeased the righteous wrath of a holy God. So that now you and I no longer have to suffer just punishment for our sins. But we can come to Jesus in faith, believing that he died for us, accept him as our Savior. And the Bible says that he removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. You can be saved. You can be forgiven. You can know that you have a home in heaven. You can experience all the blessings of salvation because of what Jesus went through because of his sufferings. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, can I urge you to do that right now? In fact, let's take a moment. Let's just end with prayer. Close your eyes. Bow your heads. It's time to eat. <laughs> but there's something far more important than eating. That says, do you know Christ as your Savior? Have you had your sins forgiven? If not, right now to him, in the quietness of your mind, he's omniscient. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're praying. He knows if you're sleeping or if you're awake. Right now, in the quietness of your mind, call out to him. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Call out to Jesus. Ask him to forgive you and to be your Savior. Put your trust 
completely in Him. Not in yourself, not in your good works, not in the things that you try to do to earn salvation. It'll never work, but in Jesus and what He did. Father in heaven, I pray that